It is, it is really a privilege every Sunday to be able to stand before you and to just share the Word of God. It, 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 we lose perspective, I think, so often that when we are able to open God's Word that we represent Him. And we do not represent ourselves. We're an ambassador for Him. And the purpose of being an ambassador is to be a minister of reconciliation, reconciling the world back to him, telling his story, telling his message, telling about his love and his greatness. It's never about us. It's never about the church. The church's purpose is to tell about his greatness and his love and his mercy and his power and his saving grace. It's his story. And it's not about a religion. If you're here this morning and you say, I came to be religious, then let me break the bad news to you. You're at the wrong place. Because we're not about a religion. We're not about a denomination. We're not about uh, being inclusive people just uh, that we're the only people that God speaks to. We represent a God who loves the world and sent a son to die for the world. And we pray today that you will experience the love of God and who we represent. Because in this world, you, you are going to have tribulation. You are going to have people... Uh, let me say it this way. How many, how many of you ever had people be mean to you? <laughs> A lot of hands went up quick. <laughs> Your memory is fresh, right? Maybe, maybe somebody has been mean to you. Uh, been uh, treated you so bad that you've had to sever a relationship with. And that's never a fun thing. Maybe you're here today and you feel lonely, you feel lost, you feel uh, like everyone's forgotten you, and you're not even sure if God loves you anymore. That's a natural place to be. We all get there at certain places in our life, and it's exactly where Satan wants us to be. Because, see, he wants us totally encompassed in our story instead of his story. But I can tell you this, if you feel that you have been mistreated or someone's been bad to you, I can say this with all the confidence that I have, God has never let you down. He's always been there. And I, in a few moments, I'm going to be talking about how to recover and move forward when people treat you bad. And you might need an extra prayer today of grace, an extra prayer today of forgiveness, an extra prayer of mercy, so that you can move on. But I think it's important that you do move on when people are bad to you or have treated you bad. So, I want to start the service talking about a relationship with a clip that is flawless on God's part. His story from the very beginning has been one of love, acceptance, grace, mercy. His story has been one about his power, his strength. And it should be our story. And if people have treated you bad, I just want to remind you how bad they treated him. And even today, they are rejecting him. When I offer the free gift of salvation, according to the Bible today, there'll be people that say, I don't want it. I don't need it. And I pray that God would open your heart and let you realize that nothing. And see, it's not about you being a good person or a bad person. We're not here to tell you you're a bad person because we're all sinners and none of us are righteous. And no matter how good we try to be, it'll never be good enough. So it has to be something that God does for us. And our righteousness has to exceed the religious crowd. That's what Jesus said. And the only way that can be done is through the grace of God. Because, see, good is relative. What I deem as good, you may not deem as good. So my relationship with God is not based on how good I am. It's based on how gracious He is. That even when I mess up, He is still loving, forgiving, and accepting of me. So this clip is for every one of you. I want to start with a relationship that every person in this place needs to have. You need to have a relationship with God because when man lets you down, God never will. Watch, and I'll be back in just a moment. me 
pain A perfect place Walking with our maker in the cool of day We turned away We took the bait From the light to darkness and its heavy chains Everything was broken Our eyes to evil opened As we left his side Life began to die From beginning to the end I made That's an amazing story, how that relationship can never be severed. Makes me want to just take you to the book of Romans chapter number 8 and tell you that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But I want to take a different direction now because we do have a perfect relationship in Christ. When man fails us, when man hurts us, and when man is bad to us, or when woman is bad to us, for all the men, th this is your cue to say Amen. Because women can be mean. <laughs> and it really shows how brave men really are. Not very brave. How many of you men 
think you are the boss at home. <laughs> yeah, 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 y'all caught that, right? How many of us know who really is in charge at home? Let me raise your hand. It's amazing there's not a phrase that says, if daddy ain't happy, ain't nobody. <laughs> what is the phrase? If mama ain't happy, you got it. Amen. I'm not even going to preach on marriage this morning. I'm not. I want to talk to you how to recover when people treat you bad because it happens to every one of us. One of the greatest tragedies in the Christian realm is when Christians are mean to other Christians. When we're told that we're to especially be kind to the household of faith. If we need to treat anybody right, we need to treat our brothers and sisters right in Christ. We do. Now, that doesn't mean that we're to treat people outside of, the, uh, outside of Christ to treat them bad. We don't find anywhere in the life of Jesus in the three and a half years that we have of his history, we don't find Jesus treating anyone bad. No, nowhere. You say, well, he cleansed the temple. Yeah, I understand. He did that with righteous indignation. But if any of those people had come back and wanted a relationship, he said, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. He'll, he would never turn you away. He never failed to give forgiveness and mercy. To the very worst person or the very worst situation, Jesus was always forgiving, always showing mercy. The problem is that we human beings tend to let our flesh take over. And we are mean to people, and people are mean to us. Can I get just a amen from everybody? Amen. Sometimes we don't mean to be mean, and there are other times we mean to be mean. And some people do it so much, it's their nature. They're just some mean-spirited people. Amen. I didn't say you were. I said there are some. Some of you might be, though. Amen. So, I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Genesis 37. Now, we're not going to read it all. I'm going to kind of give you the background behind the story because the story is nothing but a backdrop. And if you young people are in here and you have your little worksheet, that's about the life of Joseph. And Joseph was a type of Christ, actually. If we talk about typologies and a type of Christ, we can look at Joseph. He was a, an incredible man. He, he was very special to his dad. And just so that you understand uh, that in his history... Uh, about Joseph uh, is where the nation of Israel comes from. And he, he's kind of the savior uh, of the whole group, okay, the whole tribe of, of what he uh, has been set out to do. Now, his father is Jacob, and he gets a new name, name Israel. And Jacob was a brother of, of uh, Esau, and he stole a birthright, and God changes his name to Israel, and he becomes the father or founder of a people. He has 12 sons, and of those 12 sons, the one that he finds the most favor because he is anointed by God is a young boy named Joseph. You know the story, the coat of many colors. You know all of that, and his brothers are incredibly jealous of this young man named Joseph. Now, whether it be your family or whether it be your friends, there's always somebody that's going to be jealous of you. Always. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, especially in the family realm. Everybody's jockeying for position. And I find it very prominent, even in the church, that people jockey for attention and position. And people get jealous of other people in the church. You say, oh, I didn't know that one. On. You just look around. It happens in every church, not just this church. Uh, some people think, some people sing more than others. Some people get more privilege than others. Uh, he talks about them more than he talks about me. And, and he never recognizes me, but he recognizes this one. Or, or, or they seem to be always uh, uh, the one that everybody talks about how good they are. People, ha there's, it's just born in us to be jealous of certain things. Amen? Or we get jealous of how somebody looks. They just look so good all the time. I just, I love, she always has something new. All, always. I wonder where she gets her stuff because she just looks so good all the time. Somebody asked me this morning, where you, where you get all your shirts and where you get all your jackets? What'd you, he said, where'd you get that jacket? Did you get it at Dillard's? I said, no, I didn't get it at Dillard's. What'd you pay for it? About 60 bucks. I said, no, I paid $8 for it. So where'd you get it? I said, Goodwill. They thought I, they thought I was lying. I was telling the truth. And they said, tell me which one. Where good would you get it? I said, I ain't telling you where I get my good stuff. I ain't telling you that. <laughs> I bought it at Goodwill, but I ain't telling you which one. Amen? 
I will say this, my goodwill ain't over there in the ghetto. My, 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 my goodwill's up on where they have big houses, amen? <laughs> and, and they donate good stuff. I don't, I don't go to the hood to that goodwill. I, I go to the Woodlands and Kingwood, amen? Thank you. Champions Forest, you got it finally, Errol. <laughs> but Joseph was very gifted, very anointed. Read the Scriptures. The Scripture says he was anointed with wisdom. Uh, he was an interpreter of dreams. He, was, he, he had all of these incredible traits. He was a good-looking guy. He, he just, he was athletic. He had, his father was incredibly proud of him. He stuck out among the crowd, so much so that his brothers are, are incredibly jealous. And they want to kill him, but they don't actually kill him. They throw him in a pit. He's sold into slavery. They're done with Joseph. Now, just kind of, we're going to fast forward a little bit to, to, uh, to uh, Genesis chapter number 39. And it says this. And again, you can go read the other stuff because the whole theme here is not so much about Joseph. It's how to handle a situation when people are bad to you. And when I say people, I mean even family, even people who say they love you. One of the hardest things in ministry to do is to overcome when people treat you bad. You pour your life into people and they'll walk away from you. You'll spend years. You'll, you'll go to hospitals in every crisis. Uh, this year I experienced that two or three different times. I had families who had in incredible crisis and they call me and I go to the hospital not once, not twice, but five or six times. I check on them. I do everything that I possibly can do. And there's one little thing that you maybe you miss doing and they get their feathers ruffled. And after all the years of pouring your life into them, some trivial little thing will cause him to go someplace else. And it is very difficult not to get angry and upset when those things happen. It is. You feel used, you feel betrayed, you feel all of those things. But here's the one thing that I've, I've learned to put my sights on. I've asked God for two things. That's the only two things I've ever asked for in ministry. Number one is wisdom, and number two is the grace to forgive instantly. Because those are the two hardest things that you can ever encounter. To try to find wisdom so that you might lead his people the way that Solomon did, and you find forgiveness because you are going to have to exercise that so much. But in doing that, you also are visible to what God operates under. Now, this morning, before I go any further, if you have been hurt, if you have been treated bad by someone, the healing is not necessarily in them or you. The healing is that you have to get to the place that you say, I'm going to show them mercy and I am going to overlook and forgive what they did to me and how they treated me. You say, it's not fair. Really? Was it fair that God sent His Son to die for you and forgive you? Because if we all got what we deserve, we'd all bust hell wide open. But God in His grace and in His mercy pours out His love on us, and while we're yet sinners, and He sends Christ to die for us. So if you've been harmed this morning, you are not alone. Everyone that's ever been harmed by someone else, stand up in this place. Stand up right now. If you've been harmed by someone, just stand up. Look around. The reason I had you do that is that you are not alone. You may be seated. I didn't want anybody because here's what's going to happen after the service. Somebody's going to think that one of their loved ones came to me and told me a story about them. <laughs> because you're going to say you were preaching right to me. But in reality, every adult in this place stood up. And I'm not preaching to any individual. I'm, not, I, I, I'm just absolutely sharing what God asked me or told me to share with his people this morning. Because it hurts when we're treated bad. It does. But we don't need to stay there where the hurt is because it sucks. You see, you can't say that from a pulpit. Yes, I can. It sucks. That's the only way I know how to say it. It is a bad place to be when someone has hurt you and you, you have to linger there. The best thing you can do if you've been hurt is move on. Amen? Move on. Move on. You say, well, I, I hope that they'll come back. Move on. They'll find you if they really love you. Move on. They'll, they'll chase you down when they realize the wrong that they've done. Don't you linger right there with all the hurt. You move on. God has a plan for you. 
God has a purpose for you. Remember, that's the relationship that's not broken. As long as you stay in that pit where Joseph was, that means you're going to always look around and think that no one loves you. And in reality, God loves you more than you can ever comprehend. And you, if your relationship with Him is right, all the other things will be okay. Even Jesus, as He grew in strength and wisdom by the time He was 12, found favor with God and favor with men. When you find favor with God, you will find favor with men. Because God doesn't improve upon you, God makes you anew. When you become born again, there's something that happens in you. There's something you have that you didn't have before, and that's a new spirit, and a new heart, and a new mind. And you also have the understanding that comes from God Almighty Himself, as His Word is implanted in you. So, if you're ready to move on, let's, let's look at this. I'm going to give you some principles this morning. I'm going to give you some bullets, or whatever you want to call them, ways to help you move on when people treat you bad. And it's applicable for everyone in here. Okay, And the reason I can do this with clarity, I would venture to say that I've been hurt, and, and, and I'm not saying poor me, because believe me, it comes with the territory. If you're going to be in the ministry, all you young guys and gals that are in ministry, if you're going to be in ministry, you better, you better toughen up, get some thick skin, and be ready to do battle. Because you're going to get hurt. You're going to get stabbed in the back. You're going to have weight put on your shoulders that crush you. You better have, have a heart that's in good shape, because your heart's going to get broken many times. You, have, you better have a mind that is protected by the law and the, and the Word of God because people are going to mess with your mind. I promise you. You better have ears where you cannot hear because they're going to talk about you day and night and you've got to be able to tune it out. Amen? But there, on the other side, you're going to have people love you greater than you've ever been loved. You're going to have people that, that adore you. You're going to have people that will be there no matter what because there are people that get it. And there are people that know what you do matters. And those relationships are the relationships we all need to strive for. But we can't get there till we move on sometimes. I love what I do with all the difficulty that I'm telling you it brings. I love what I do. Believe it or not, I love you. I do. I love you guys. I love what I do. I've had many opportunities to leave, to fill in resumes, to, to answer calls. I don't want to go. I love you guys. I don't know why. I just do. I just do. Because when it is a family unit... There's no explanation as to how we're supposed to love in a family. We just do. We call this Grace Family Church. When you become part of this body, and you pour your heart and soul into this ministry, and you support the things that we do, there is a bond in here that is, I believe, unequivocally one of the best bonds that human beings can ever have. And it doesn't have to be the biggest building or the richest income. It's about the people, and there is a love that it, you cannot describe it. Adrian told me this morning, uh, this will be his last Sunday. Where are you at, Adrian? I know you're in here somewhere. Didn't, next Sunday would be his last Sunday. He's been serving. Well, they moved across town. He's getting ready to retire, and he's going to where the grass is greener and all that kind of stuff. And moving close to family, and, and he has been one of the most faithful servants. He's been one of our deacons that we could ever have in our church. He's been responsible for n numerous people coming. He, he brought uh, Omar to us. He witnessed to Omar, brought Omar. I mean, it's just, it's been countless. He's always been there. He does the jobs, uh, he and Sean, that nobody else wants to do. Uh, just been really, really faithful. And it hurts when those relationships get severed. This is for the right reason. It hurt when Matt had to leave. It was Matt's time to move on. It hurt. I, I, my, my young uh, ministry assistant and associate, uh, for 20 years, he'd been, he'd been with me. And it hurts. I understand why. But it still hurts. Well, it's nothing mean, and nothing mean with Adrian, but sometimes, even in a good relationship, because their reasons are right, I still have to move on. I can't sit there and say, oh, I'm so sorry, Matt's not here. I'm sorry, Adrian's not here. Nobody will ever be able to do what Adrian did. Nobody ever fixed toilets like Adrian fixes them. <laughs> or, the se or the septic pump. <laughs> Nobody will ever, I mean, I can't, I can't sit there and do that. 
I got I to gotta move on and find somebody who will clean a toilet and fix a septic pump. Because you're still here. And we still have to minister to you. I can't find anybody. Matt was such a wonderful teacher. And he, I love those stories about his kids. His kids, uh, I mean, we learned how to be better parents listening to Matt. We really did. Amen? Those of you on Wednesday night, didn't we? It was good. It was funny. And I, I can't sit there and say, oh, what's that? I miss him so much. I do miss him, but I got to move on. And he had to move on. And Adrian has to move on. Those are good relationships, but even in those, we have to move on sometimes. Now, I'm going to, from this point on, I'm going to talk about some negative stuff. So hang with me and how you can get out of that and how you can move on. Principle number one, verses one and two of Genesis 39 says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, and brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Okay, and it says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he, was, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, let me stop right here, because here's the principle. Even when the people you love reject you, if you stay with the Lord, you can still get somewhere in life. Because it's not people that determine your destiny, it's God that determines your destiny. And if your image is always good with God and your relationship with God is good, if you stay with the Lord, you are still going to be a success. The Ishmaelites bought Joseph out of the pit from the brothers. They sell him into slavery in Egypt. You know the story. He goes into prison and, and, and he, he has this great gift and he gets into this guy named Potiphar's house. It's going to lead to some more trouble, but the, dip, but the issue is here. He still served the Lord. He still knew who he was about. He still had his character. Let me say this. Don't let people define who you are. Don't let people or circumstances define who you are. You define who you are. And sometimes we get into relationships that we realize they're bad for us. Let me just say this. The Scripture says when it comes to relationships that if you're a believer, you're not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And I don't mean that to sound mean, but it simply means that you guys are so opposite, you're hardly ever going to be successful in this thing. A saved person is not going to be able to communicate with a lost person the way that two saved people can. And many people say, well, I'll just win them, or I'll win her, or I'll win him, and I'll, I'll preach Jesus to them. Probably you won't, because if they won't get saved to pursue you, they're not going to get saved after they got you for free. Amen? You say, well, I don't know if I like that reasoning. Well, I'm just telling you, I've been doing this for a long time, and I know how it works. And if you are a believer, and you're getting an unbeliever, and you want to marry them, and you come and ask me, don't get offended when I say no. Because I've had people get mad. Well, I can't believe I'm going to go find another church. He wouldn't marry me because my, 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 my girlfriend wasn't saved. No, I, I, I would love to, but I want your girlfriend to be saved. I want you to start right. I would talk to her about Jesus, and I would talk to her about accepting the Lord. And if she was not willing to do that, you know what? I would say that your marriage is not going to be successful because if she can't learn to love you and do what Scripture says now, she's not going to do it later, and vice versa. You say, oh, he's so handsome. He's got such a good job. But he, you know, and, and I know I love Jesus, but I'm going to preach Jesus to him. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to marry you until he gets saved. Because if he don't love you enough now, he's not going to love you enough later. Amen. And I'd be disobedient to Scripture, and I'm not going to do that when it comes to marrying someone. Now, if you both love the Lord, come talk to me. We'll, we'll marry you all day long. Amen. We'll do it. We will. So when people, when the people you love reject you, if you stay with the Lord, you can get somewhere in life. The Lord is always with us. He's never forsaking us. I told you about that relationship with that song. The Lord accepts us where we are, and the Lord is our helper. So you got to stay with God because man is constantly letting you down. Man is constantly failing you. Man is constantly uh, uh, deceiving you, lying to you, uh, uh, doing everything. There are very few people. That's why Proverbs says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Even your family will lie to you and hurt you. Even there's great jealousy within family units. You all know what I'm talking about, right? And some of your greatest hurt has probably come through family members. 
But you got to move on. And you got to stay with the Lord so you can still get somewhere in life. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says this. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. My focus is on the Lord and, and that relationship with him. Because as I focus on him, I learn how to be better. And let me tell you, at the end of the day, I may be the problem in the relationship and I just don't want to admit it. And someone had to leave me. And they had to move on. And I'm blaming them. But it may be that I've been so unfocused that I've not even shown what the Lord has told me to be like. Many of us profess to be Christians, but we don't act like it. Amen? So you, you've got to be able to, to, to look at the Lord and say, He is my helper. Let me give you principle number two. Because remember, principle number one, stay with the Lord and, and keep your focus on Him. And regardless of what man does, you will still be a success. In the scripture it says, even though Joseph had been sold, he had been sold into slavery, even though he had all these difficult things going on in his life, he was still a success. Still. So it brings us to principle number two. Don't let your past rejections be your controlling focus today. Don't let your past rejections be your controlling focus today. A lot of people, a lot of people, they feel God has something for them. And it just hasn't happened yet. If you're one of those people, you believe God has something for you, but it hasn't happened yet. Maybe you've been rejected a little bit. Let me see your hand. Let me see who you are. Just put your hand up. You believe God has something. Keep it up high, just where I can look. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. You can put it down. God bless you. Don't let your past rejections. I had a person tell me not long ago, said, I have applied to four different churches, and I was rejected by every one of them. And here's what they said. I think I'm going to quit the ministry. Really? Maybe those were just tests to see what kind of fortitude you had to stay in the ministry. You don't ever give up. I heard Jim McInvale yesterday uh, talk about how to be successful in business. And one of the first thing he said, said, keep God first. Principle number one, keep God first. And number two, he said, never give up. Never give up. If God has told you to do something, don't let anything get in the way of that pursuit. Don't let man frame your destiny. If God has told you something, listen to God. And don't let anything get in the way. And, and your past rejections can't be what controls you. If Joseph had said, oh, I'm just, they threw me in the pit and I, I've been into slavery and, and I'm going to get an opportunity. Look, God will always give you another opportunity. And you can't let your past rejections be your controlling focus today. You say, Pastor Mike, have you ever failed more than you want to know? Have you ever made a lot of uh, critical mistakes more than you want to know? But I have learned more from my failures and my mistakes than I have my successes. And I don't let those failures and bad decisions frame me. Those were truly mistakes. If I keep doing them, they become a life pattern. It's no longer a mistake. It's how I act. So when I learn from making a bad judgment or doing something wrong or, or, or messing up, when I learn from it, it is just something that I've learned to get me to a different level. If I continue to do it, then it's nothing more than a lifestyle that I have embraced and I am just kind of wallowing in the thing and it's controlling me. So you can't let your past rejections be your controlling focus. Some problems of the past we will never fix. Never. Some things that have happened in your life, they'll never be fixed. Let me just tell you that right now. Some of you were treated so bad, they'll never be fixed. You can't go back and fix it. You can't. You can't retake that test that cost you uh, uh, this, and you can't go back and remake that decision that cost you that. Some things can never be fixed. Maybe you were in a good relationship, and you were the one that blew it. It's too late to fix it now. But you can sure make sure your future relationships are better. Amen? So you can't let the past rejections be your controlling focus. Some people that have rejected us will never forgive us or accept us. Maybe you were wrong. Maybe you did something you shouldn't have done. And you went and asked that person to forgive you, and they said, I'll never forgive you. You can't control whether they ever forgive you or not. If they don't forgive you, that's on them. That's not on you. 
When you ask for forgiveness and you are starting to move on and keeping God as your focus, you can't make somebody forgive you. And if you can make them, it's not real forgiveness anyway. They need to forgive you because they want to forgive you. You move on. If God has forgiven you of the wrong that you did and this person want, then I'd much rather have God's approval than man's approval. You move on. Don't let them keep you in that bondage. And let me just say this. Not everybody is going to like you. Most of us think everybody likes us. I know one thing for sure. Everybody don't like me. Amen. I know that for a fact. Not everybody likes me. And I'm okay with that because I don't like some of them. Amen? I'm okay with it. I don't have to be the most liked person. I don't have to have everybody's approval. They don't, they don't frame me. They, it, look, if I wanted all of you guys to like me, I would tell you how wonderful you are. I'd tell you, go ahead and do this. You'd say, Pastor Mike, can we go? Can, you, do you think it's okay if we do this and we do this? And I'd say, yes, I'll just be a yes man. Yes, you can. Yes, you can have 13 girlfriends. Yes, you can. It'll be good. Can, can we go? Do you, what do you think about drunkenness? Get drunk. Just go ahead and get drunk. What do you think? You, Pastor Mike, you think we can smoke? Smoke all the pot you want. Just smoke it, smoke it, smoke it. Uh, now, some of you are going to say, Pastor Mike said we can smoke pot. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that some people will say anything to get approval. And I won't do it. So not everybody likes me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you when you're wrong. And I'm going to tell you when you're doing good. And I'm going to love you in both cases. You understand what I'm saying? So you, you can't let your past rejections con be your controlling focus for today. And some people that have rejected us, they'll, they will never, ever forgive us, no matter how hard you try. When you go to them and you take a witness, here's what I recommend. If you go and say, would you forgive me? And they say no, do what Scripture says. Go to Matthew 28, read that, and then you take an elder of the church, you take somebody spiritually mature, take them as a witness and say, look, I'm begging you to forgive me. I wronged you. I am sorry, and I'm asking you to forgive me. Would you pray with me about it? If they say no, you have been released biblically. You know, it, you're as good as clean again. You say, well, they still don't like me. So what? Go find somebody who do, who, who do like you. <laughs> I didn't say don't try to get them to forgive you. Take a witness. Get them to come to the altar because here's the deal. They don't forgive you. Their giving will never be blessed until they do. They'll be cursed. Their prosperity will be held back because they withheld forgiveness. Because if we can't forgive the Father, the, the Scripture says you can't forgive. How do you expect the Father to forgive you? You understand what I'm saying? So don't let your past rejections hold you back. Principle number two, because some perceptions of the past are not what they seem to be. And see, we're not always wrong. When somebody accuses us of being wrong, you say, well, should I ask them to forgive me anyway? If they think we wronged them, you go tell them again, forgive me. I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry you had that perception, but forgive me. Don't let it control you. A lot, you know, a lot of times we don't know the facts to what we hear. We just don't know them. So what should our focus be? Here's our focus. Again, on principle number two. Ephesians chapter 3 gives four verses that are beautiful. This is what Paul says, think on. He says this. He says, this is what I want God to do, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. In other words, Paul said this. says, if you really want to learn how to, how, 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 what to focus on, it's the inner man. We all worry about the outward man, the coat, the shirt, the jeans, how we look. We spend more time. Uh, I bet most of you spent more time getting yourself ready for church than you spent in the Word of God this week. Now, my wife's on the road, so I, I, she's going to Florida. Her father's not doing well. Uh, but it takes her a long time to get ready, man. <laughs> she ain't here. I can say it. <laughs> I'm one of those brave husbands, Amen. We spend more time working, worried about the outward than we do the inward. And Paul says this. He says that, you, that, that his spirit would dwell in you on the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. In other words, when you focus on how much God loves you, and how his spirit moves in you in the new man... 
You cannot but help to forgive and love other people because God loves them as much as he loves you. You say, well, you even, you don't know how bad they were and what they did. At your worst, he loved you, and at their worst, he loves them. And he wants both of you to get together and love one another. Amen? Because in that, you both will be able to move on in a relationship. And he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God said, Paul said, you want, you want to heal a relationship? Think about God's love. Let the inner man be moved. Let the power of God work in your life. And you quit trying to do it all yourself and move forward. Principle number three, Genesis 39, 6 through 9. You got to be committed to holy living no matter what. Because as Joseph was taken to Potiphar's house and taking care of, of the entire house, everything that was controlled, Potiphar was a very important guy. But Potiphar had a wife that was a hottie. She was a hussy, really. You say, you shouldn't be saying those things. Oh, well, I'm telling you, this is one bold sister. Because she, she saw Joseph. He's young. She got the hots for Joseph. That's the only way I know how to say it because that's what Scripture said. Because she asked him boldly, would you come sleep with me? She tried to entice him two or three times, and here's the deal. He had this incredible character about himself. Be committed to holy living no matter what. Be committed to whole, holy living no matter what. Because, see, Joseph, he's trying to move on in the relationship. He's been rejected. He's been into slavery. He gets out. He gets a second chance. He gets to be in Potiphar's house, and he's got this, this, this floozy of a woman trying to entice him and says, come sleep with me. And he absolutely says, I will not. I will not. The master has entrusted all of his care to me. I am not going to let him down. I know it's wrong. And he starts to flee from the house, and she even grabs his clothes. This is a bold sister. I understand we live in a bold society. It ain't like it was when I was young. I'm glad. I'd be scared. I'm, I'm glad. It's, it's bad. So you've got to be committed to holy living no matter what. You've got to have character in this kind of relationship. When God is telling you to move on, you've got to display character. Because if we don't display character, what we start to do, misery loves what? It does. And we start to let the devil come in and start to divide our thoughts and start to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to go back to church. People were mean to me. I got hurt at church. And, and, and you know, I, I, that's the number one thing we get when we try to ask people to come. I'd come to church, but, you know, you church people are, are all hypocrites. How many of you ever heard that? All you ever want is what? Money. All, all you ever want is money. You, you, y'all a bunch of hypocrites. Y'all don't forgive anybody. I mean, that's what we always hear. And we know that's not true. But you got to have character in the relationship, and you must have commitment in the relationship, and must have Christ in the relationship. you got to have that. As we look at verses 6 through 9, as, as the Scripture says this uh, about this, this lady, it simply says this, Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and that in what he did uh, not know that he had except for the bread that he ate. He, in other words, Potiphar says, I'm, I'm giving it all to Joseph. I don't even know how to run everything. All I know is that Joseph takes care of everything. The bread's there. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He was good looking. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said uh, to his master's wife, look, my master does not know uh, what is with me in the house and has committed all that he has to my hand. And there is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He respected his boss in the relationship, but he said, I'm going to stay pure to God. You want to move on? You've got to stay pure to God. Be committed to holy living no matter what. And Joseph was. Principle number four. You can go down and read verses 10 through 14. When your world is turned upside down, and it will be, we must rely on the Lord and learn to trust Him. Because what happens, this woman cries rape on Joseph, who is totally innocent, and he's cast into prison. You say, well, that hardly seems fair. Let me just tell you this. Let me let you know a secret. Life's not fair. People are mean. Would you say that woman was mean to Joseph when she lied on him? She was mean. But he didn't let it control him. 
He began to move forward. And when your world is turned upside down, and it will be, we must rely on the Lord and learn to trust Him. Because if you'll read verses 10 to 14, it said He's cast into prison. But guess what? In prison, you know one thing they find about this guy? Has incredible character. He has this incredible gifting of God. And by the way, if God has gifted you, God will not take the gift away. You're always gifted. And he remembers the Lord. And in prison, they recognize he is special. And he still trusts in God, even though there's a negative circumstance or a bump in the road in his life. You know what a bump in the road is? It's just something that gets your attention. It's to keep you on track and to slow you down sometimes. And sometimes we have to have bumps in the road to keep us on the course. You understand what I'm saying? So you've got to learn to trust in the Lord when your world has been turned upside down. How many of you have ever had your world turned upside down? And you, you look for all kind of help, but when you trust in God, my life verse is this. You're going to see it on the screen. I, look, I'll share it with you. I'll let it be your life verse too. Look at this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Even when your world is upside down, all your heart. You've got to trust in the Lord. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. She cries rape. He gets fired from his job. He's put into jail, but he's still trusting in the Lord. You can't let anything, regardless of what people do, because, see, Satan will use people to get you derailed from trusting God. And God has a big plan, a big plan and an opportunity for Joseph. Let me give you principle number five. Look for positive things that the Lord is doing even when it doesn't make sense or we don't understand. You know, God is always working. Scripture says He never sleeps, He never slumbers, never takes a break. You don't have to worry about praying. God will always answer. You know, you're never going to get God on His day off. God's always available. And God is always working when we don't even understand what's going on. I can look back and tell you, man, there were some things going on in my life, and I did not have a clue why it was happening. I did not have a clue why I was rebelling. I did not have a clue why I made this decision. Uh, by the way, you guys got picked for me to come here. Brenda and Jim will probably be the only ones that can appreciate this. Remember the struggle that you guys had with me? Yes, you do. <laughs> he came to me and he said, Pastor Mike, we, we want you to be our pastor. We had, what, about seven or eight people maybe at the time? Fourteen people. Had a few. Didn't own a building, didn't have any money except the money Jim had kept the church going with. He was the only giver. They took an offering. It was one check. It was Jim's, you know. And I come preach one time, and there was only what, five, 14 people there. And I left a church that on my last Sunday there probably had 800 in attendance. I would resigned, and I kind of masked that. What I was really hoping to do was just quit. I said, I'm going to take a break for a while, go into evangelism. But that was just kind of a cover-up, say, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of people. I've been doing it for too long. I've been hurt too much. Everything that I'm talking to you about is how I crafted this message. And he come to me and he said, I want you to pray about being a pastor. He called me in South Carolina and uh, said, I, I, I want you to do it. So anyway, I tell, long story short, I fought him tooth and nail. I wouldn't commit. We went to pick out tile. We went to pick out this. We went to do that. And I just fought it all the time. I just didn't, I just didn't want to do it. And every time I would fight it, I'd come under a great conviction. Now remember, Sunday I preached, we had about 14 people. That was all that was in the church. And then he said, would you and Miss Phyllis meet me, uh, meet with me and Brenda over at the property of the church? They had secured the property and they had the building was framed next door. And we pulled up in the driveway, and immediately, we didn't have any concrete, it was dirt at the time. We pulled up, and immediately, it was like an audible voice said, Why are you fighting me? This is where you're going to be. Now, I'd already had a resume in Corpus Christi at a church that ran 2,000. 2,000. And they wanted me. Church of 2,000. It was narrowed down at the end between me and another guy. We were the two finalists. And Jim's talking to me about coming here, and I had 14 in attendance. <laughs> and I didn't want to come. My heart was set on being picked 
to go to Corpus. I had a daughter down there, and I loved the tropical uh, setting, and I thought, man, what a per God is so good. And I pull up on the property, and God said, this is where you're going to be. This is where I want you. And immediately at that moment, I knew where I was supposed to be. I didn't understand it. I didn't really like it. <laughs> but I knew it. And I had to learn to trust in the Lord. And what did I say when I started this sermon? How do I care about you? What I didn't like and thought to come, I love you guys. I don't ever want to go anywhere else. This is where I found my perfect place. This is, this is my home. This is where I'm going to end my days in ministry right here. A place I didn't want to come to. I'd been hurt there, the other church. I, so much so, I resigned. And it was prospering. It was doing incredibly well. I fought Jim and Brenda tooth and nail. I, I actually had another person that had just won the lottery, won $14 million. And he begged me to start a church at his new complex. He said, you don't have to pay anything. I'll give you the building for free for two years. Right at the same time, he's pulling me up on the property. Had a church in Corpus Christi, and I don't have peace about either one of those. I pull up here, and the Lord said, this is it. I looked at her. She looked at me. Tears rolling down my face. I said, this is it. This is it. And in those 15 years, I can't tell you how many hundreds, maybe even thousand people that have come to Christ since we've been here. The church in Corpus Christi, eight months after I told them take my name off the deal, the church split eight months later. The property that was given over, that was to be given me, was to given to another man, and they have a restaurant in it now. And the one that I didn't want to be here 15 years later, we're still going strong, still winning people for Christ. God is always working when you don't know what's going on. And you've got to look for the positive things that the Lord is doing even when it doesn't make sense or even when we don't understand it. Why would I leave a church of 800 to come to a church of 14? Why would I choose a church of 14 over a church of 2,000? Why wouldn't I get a building over there that the guy was going to build out and give it to me free for two years? Right on 59, mainstream at North Park Drive, right where, where the money was at. And I had a lot of followers that would have followed there. Why come to a place so far away where none of the followers? You know why? Because God told me to. He knows more than I know. He knows where his ground needs to be plowed the most. And he brought me here, and I've loved it ever since. I, I love our church. I love you guys. Paul says this, because you've got to look for the positive things. Philippians 3.13, Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. You've been hurt? Forget it. Move forward. You're not the only one that's been hurt and quit crying and whining and wiping your nose and having pity parties and saying, Poor me. I say, Move forward. You say, well, You're not being nice. I know it. But I'm helping you. Now, if, if you had the list of all the wrongs that have been committed to me and all the hurts, you'd say, I wouldn't be in ministry either. Yes, you would. Because when you see how many people come to Christ and how many people receive what you do, it far outweighs the bad. And you don't do it because it's good or bad. You do it because he tells you to do it. It's his favor. I'm not going to let my yesterdays mess up my todays. Too many of you are letting your yesterdays mess up your todays. You're looking back and thinking, what if? What if I'd have done this? What if I'd have done that? What if I made a better decision? What if I... <laughs> you can't bear fruit where you're at. You're not a fruit bearer. Wherever God has planted you, bear fruit. He wants you to bear fruit. You, if you're at grace right now, you say, I haven't borne any fruit, then you, you start fertilizing what you're doing, and you water it, and you cultivate it, you, you, you stay committed, you live holy, and you keep God, and look for the good that God is doing. Look, we, we'll be the first to admit, we don't have the best facilities. We didn't build a fancy $4 million building, but I bet you we give more money to missions than some of these other big churches. 
We don't pay our staff exorbitantly big. Most of them are bivocational. But we pay them wonderfully fair. We're always good to them, and the church is good to us. We believe that what we do, we don't milk people for money. If you're visiting, you're not a place where I'm going to send you a thing about giving. You don't have to sign no pledge to join our church that if you give a certain amount of money. And let me just say this. Because you do give money does not mean you're going to get a position of honor in this place because you give money. Because you know what? Money doesn't matter. Serving Him matters the most. Amen? Amen. Now, should I give money? You better. (laughs) You'll be poor. Whatsoever man soweth, he shall reap. Amen? So... You can't let your yesterdays mess up your days. Our past are real, but they shouldn't control us. I'm going to reach forward so my tomorrows will be better than my yesterdays. I used to go to the jail, and and that's how I got started preaching. I go to jail. Nobody else let me preach. I just wasn't worth worth a flip. I I didn't know anything, and uh, I wasn't very good, and... And the only place I get in, a man named Freddie Ware was a county chaplain. He used to let me come in and preach on a, on a Thursday night. I could get he give me the whole night. Thursday night, they, if you wanted to go to church on in the jail, they'd give us a big room and ever and believe me, they wanted out of their cells. So I, we were packed, we packed, packed, sweat, s- smell bad. You know what I'm talking about, brother. Smells bad. Everybody dressed alike. Ain't nobody in there competing about how they look. They all dressed alike. They're all Longhorn fans. All of them wearing orange. I thought I was at a Longhorn pep rally. Go to the jail every week. Amen. And, 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 but I'd get up and, man, I'd preach. I'd just let it fly. I didn't have to worry about how eloquent I was. I didn't have to worry about what I, what I, what I said. I had a little brother. Uh, matter of fact, Mark Napier. Justin, where you at? You're over there? Napier used to go with me. And we were called the M&Ms. They'd let the M&Ms come in. Mike and Mark, he'd come in, a little cassette player, and he'd sing. Man, I'd see grown men just cry and weep. And I'd get up and preach, man. And, and, and again, I was horrible. I mean, I don't know how good it was, but I, I, this is what I do know. Every time we'd preach, that whole room would fall on their face before God. You said, well, they, they all broke the law. They're all, they're all a captivated audience. Yeah, I understand that. But we all broke the law. And we're all unrighteous. And we all need His grace. And their hearts were desperate for something fresh and new. And I get up and preach, and I used to, I got an old red Bible of it. I can't even use it anymore. I had it bound three times. I, I preached so many messages out of it. But I used to write in the back, and you've heard me say this before, because it just jogs my memory of all the people that'd be saved. It'd say 37, 47, 57, 67. It depends on how many. And then I started doing revivals, and I'd write down how many were saved. And, and those were wonderful days, but those days don't make me. You know what makes me is the hope that I'll see some more days when I see 37 people saved or 77 people saved or God do a miracle and heal somebody for cancer or 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 some miraculous thing that God will use me for. My my past, I'm looking, I'm reaching forward for better things. My best days are not behind me, my best days are in front of me. I'm smarter, I'm better, I can actually preach now and teach the word of God. I mean, well, thank you. Somebody said amen. (laughs) That was probably Jim. He used to hear it years ago. Used to be when I'd preach, all I'd do was cry. I I wouldn't get through four verses and I'd weep. I'd just weep. Man, the power of God was so, look, but look, that was, that's wonderful. And I had some great times in the past. But I'm not dwelling in the past even with the good. I'm looking forward to the future. I'm looking forward to some great things. So I'm not going to let my yesterdays frame me or mess up my todays. I'm going to reach forward. That's what Paul said. Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forget those things which are behind, and I'm reaching forward to those things that are ahead for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. I had not got the prize yet. I'm still reaching. I'm going to get it one day because, see, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant not well said good and faithful servant I'm still reaching the word comes from a Greek word that means that I'm always stretching and 
and longing for that prize. I never can obtain it, but I'm always struggling to reach forward toward the prize. And I can't do that if I'm always worried about the, what the past used to be like. God's forgiven it. God's approved of what we did that was successful. But I'm reaching forward for better things. Better days. Better days. I remember preaching in that smelly place. No air. It stunk. Everybody wore orange. Now I get to preach in a place that's air-conditioned. It don't stink. And all of you got on something different. Amen? <laughs> and people still respond to the Word of God. Principle number five. Again, don't look at... Uh, look for the positive things that the Lord is doing, even when it doesn't make sense or we don't understand, because I promise you, He's always there. Principle number six. Hang on. You got to fast forward to chapter 41, verses 50 and 52. You got to realize and receive the current new relationship the Lord has given us. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the story, but here's the deal. There's a great famine that comes in the land, and Pharaoh himself says, we're in trouble, Egypt. There's a famine coming. He hears a story about a guy that's in jail named Joseph who is still living devoutly, still trusting in the Lord, and they tell him, the baker of the prison tells Pharaoh, where it gets back to Pharaoh from the baker, hey, there's a guy in prison, man, he can interpret dreams. Pharaoh says, bring him to me. And he starts to tell him what to do and how to do it because he was anointed of God. He kept God his focus, and if you fast forward and you look at that, you got to realize and receive the current new relationships the Lord has given us. And here's what, what happens. The Lord makes uh, Joseph prosper in Pharaoh's house, in Pharaoh's kingdom. And, and what happens is Joseph becomes the number two guy in all the land of Egypt. All the land of Egypt, the guy that was sold by his brothers into slavery lied about by a bold sister, and when she cried rape, put into prison, gets out, and he's number two in the house of Pharaoh because of God's gifting and God's anointing on his life. He's able to interpret dreams, and what he's literally going to do, he's going to save Egypt when the famine and drought comes, and he's going to save the people that God set aside that were called his people. Now, it all started out for bad when the brothers were jealous and sold him away. He endured some hard times, but he was able to recover. And, and principle number six, you got to realize and receive the current new relationships the Lord has given us. Because Genesis 41, verses 51 through 52, Joseph called the name of the firstborn. Now, here's what happened. He prospers in Pharaoh's kingdom. He gets a wife. He marries. He's prosperous. He's actually very rich. Number two person in the kingdom with a ring senate, a seal that's only second to Pharaoh. He has two sons. He names them. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Here's the interpretation. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second son he calls Ephraim. Here's why. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Listen to me, when you move forward, you've got to realize and receive the current new relationship the Lord has given you. If 50, it used to be, I used to say 51% of people end in divorce. Unfortunately, that's not true anymore. It is 62%. Married people will end in divorce, 62%. And let me just say this. For most people, you got a better deal now than what you had when you started. You say, what, what, what? You went through something bad, and now you're at some place good. Receive it. Receive it. You should have already repented that the marriage fell apart. Repent, move forward, and receive the good thing that you got now. I've told some of you, boy, you got the better end of that deal. Amen? God is always in control of our life. And you've got to move forward. God would never want you to be in a place, never want you to be in a place that's called the pit where you can't move forward, where your eyes are off focus. And don't any of you, don't you dare say, well, you're telling me to jump out of my marriage. And it's, I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you, you do everything to save that marriage, to make it right, to make it whole. But there's some things that you just can't control. And if you can't control it, move on. You can't make them love you. And you can't make them better. Amen. And understand this. 
The best thing that's ever happened to you hasn't happened yet, probably. So be able to move on. You've got to receive the current relationship the Lord has given us. As I told you, I love it here. I do. I, have zi I don't send a resume to anybody. When I get an offer or get a phone call or, or hear about a church saying, would you come? I am not. I don't even respond. I have no, no inkling about it because I realize and receive this is where the Lord wants me. And I love it. I'd like it. People say, why don't you go one of these bigger places? Man, you, 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 you just feel it. You, you, you just, you, they'd pack in. It ain't about packing them in. It's about pleasing Him. It's about doing what He says. I'd rather take the challenge. Let's build something great here, and then He gets all the glory. Amen? I don't want to run and build on somebody else's foundation. We're not done. We got time. Praise the Lord. You say, forget what? See, we see when, when, when He talked about Manassas, that for God has made me forget all my toil. Forget what? We see Joseph remembers. What he has forgotten is the pain of the past. You'll never forget your past. But you've got to forget the pain. There comes a point in time you've got to heal. And if you're not healed from it, you had not trusted God enough. Because he is our healer and our sustainer. He heals the broken heart. He heals and guards our minds. And the issue is you say, I haven't healed yet. It, well, then you haven't spent enough time with the Lord. Because if you spend enough time with the Lord, he will heal you. He will. So his pain has is what he's remembering, okay? Uh, he, what he, I mean, what he's forgotten is the pain of the past, and he's remembering how good and gracious God is. And, and Ephraim, we must count our blessings today. I, I count my blessings every week. What a blessing it is. I've got some other young men that, that are in the ministry, and they just absolutely would love to have what we have. And I just count my blessings. I'm sure they're bigger and better and all that other good stuff that's out there. And there's people on the radio. Hey, I can get on the radio. Somebody won't pay for it. We'll be on the radio tomorrow. Being, let me let, let you know a secret. Being on the radio is not being good. Being on the radio is having money to get on the radio. Some of you want to underwrite it? We'll, we'll get a radio show and we'll take our message to everybody in Houston. Amen. And you'll really love it because I'll really stir the pot. <laughs> you will. You will. We'll get, we'll, we'll get some wow going on. We'll, we, we will certainly get some talk going, amen? Because on the radio, would you, would you tone it down? Nope. Call it like I see it. Because people need the truth, and the truth will set them free. Amen? So, he learned from his past. His old family was dysfunctional, but his new family is right, and he's receiving it. Principle number seven, I'm going to close. Don't be looking to pay back. This is, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Don't be looking to pay somebody back for what they did to you. Don't repay evil for evil. Romans 12, 17 to 21 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you heap coals of fire on his head, and do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't, don't, don't let it come out of your mouth. I'm going to get even. See, when your relationship is right with the Lord and God is first in your life, then you don't repay evil for evil. Because he said, I'll take care of that. I'm going to take care of you. It's important. I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna, to do all that. It's important that you do that. See, you've got to look to forgive. You've got to seek the Lord's purpose. The largest principle in the Christian life, folks, is love. And under the blanket of love, its first cousin is forgiveness. When Jesus gave us a new commandment in the New Testament to go with the Ten Commandments, he, says, he said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Unconditionally. Overlooking sin. Accepting people as bad as they are. Because they're just people. So the number one blanket that we can do is forgive. If you can't forgive, you're in trouble. Romans 8, 28, you got to the, seek the Lord's purpose and that principle. Don't, look, don't, uh, don't be looking to pay, pay, pay back with evil. You've got to remember, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. You've got to remember that God has forgiven you and showed you mercy. 
I've had people say, Pastor Mike, how do you forgive so easy? How can you accept that person back and give them another chance? I simply say it because God has given me a second chance and he accepts me. And who would I be to have an opinion that's so different from the one who saved me? The one who is my example, the one who is my redeemer. I can't redeem anybody and he redeemed me. If I'd have been God, I wouldn't have loved me. If I'd been God, I wouldn't have loved some of you. And you wouldn't have loved you either if you'd have been God. But let me let you in on a question. He loves you today, and he forgives you today. You've got to remember that God has forgiven you and showed you mercy, so you have no point, no choice, but to show somebody else mercy and move on. Yes, you're going to remember some pain. Yes, you are. But you've got to look around and see the good that God is going to. You're never, going to. you're never going to forget how it hurts, but remember this, God can heal the pain. I want you to bow your heads with me. Kenny, I want you to come, bring the lights down, because I want to take just a moment <clears throat> just to deal with some people that maybe got some issues in their life. And I'm not going to make you talk about the issue. I'm not, I don't want to know about your issue. What I'm concerned with is you moving on. Somebody's been mean to you. Somebody has hurt you so bad that it is absolutely hindering you right now. Hindering you right now. And I, yeah, I don't want you looking at somebody else's business. This is their business. It's not your business, okay? And we're going we're gonna to ask them to raise their hand in just a minute. But right now, I want you to pray and say, yes, I've been hurt, and I want to ask the Lord to forgive me for dwelling here, and I want to move forward. I want to get out of this place, and I want to move forward. I, 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 I want to go forward. I want to reach for that prize. I don't want this to be holding me back. I, I, I don't want to be hindered by what has happened to me in the past. And if I need to forgive somebody and I need to go to them, then I'll be willing to do it. And I want to pray for you. But you take a moment right now, just right now, and search your heart and say, Ask yourself, do I need to do something to move forward? Do I need to release somebody by forgiving them? Do I need to get out of this pit? Do I need to quit remembering and dwelling in the pain? Do I need to keep reliving it over again? Paul said, I forget those things that are behind. Just examine your heart. And if you need prayer right now to move forward... Because somebody has hurt you so bad and you want me to pray for you, just stand up right where you're at and I'll pray for you. I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to have you come forward. I just want to pray for you. I see you. God bless you and you. I'm talking about some mature people. I'm talking about some young people. I'm talking about some adults. God bless you. Just stand and stay standing. All over the building, people are standing. All over the building. You don't need to look around. If you need to stand, I want to pray for you. This is going to be your first step. You're going to have to do the rest. You're going to have to spend time with the Lord. You're going to have to uh, be specific with what you're doing. And don't dwell where you're at. Move forward. Do whatever it takes to get out of this situation. If you need to tell somebody, forgive me, go tell them. If you need to write a letter and tell somebody, I'm sorry, write the letter. If you need to just buckle up your bootstraps and say, I'm moving forward. I'm not letting this hold me back anymore. I, I've had too many doors shut, but I'm, I, and I was going to quit. I'm not going to quit anymore. Just do it. Now, I'm going to pray for you. There must be 30, 40 people standing. Anybody else, if you need me to pray for you, stand right now. I want you to receive it. I'm praying for each, indiv each individual person standing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you right now for touching hearts and touching minds. And Father, I ask forgiveness for each and every situation here. Some of these people are absolutely innocent and they've been wronged, they've been hurt, they've been slandered, they've been uh, mistreated, they've been unloved, they've been abused. People have shut doors on them, but Father, I ask you right now to give them the courage to move forward. And I pray for every person who hurt them. That in hurting them, they learned how to not treat people. And I pray that they would have asked for forgiveness or would ask for it at this time. Let your Holy Spirit work on both sides. 
But Father, I know you're all powerful. I know that all things work together for good. And I also know you're the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. So God, show us all mercy here. But more than that, let us practice forgiveness as we have received forgiveness in your sight. Let it not hinder our lives. Let us look around and see all the good that you're doing, and let us be vessels that bear fruit in the place that you put us. And let us be content with serving you and pleasing you. In Jesus' name I pray for each and every man, woman, boy, and girl that are standing right now. Amen and amen. You may be seated right now. Right now, just go ahead and be seated. No, nobody else's business. This was your business between you and God. You got to receive it. You got to do it. Now, I, I just want to ask I don't know. I'm going to take the assumption that everybody in here knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But you know what? That's not a safe position. I can't assume that. So I have to ask you maybe you're here today and you say, I don't know Christ as my Savior. But there's something going on in me right now that I can't explain, and I would like to receive Christ as my Savior. If you are like that, if you've never received Christ, and would you like, and you would like to be saved or be born again, the way the Scripture says, Jesus said you must be born again. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's not a physical new birth. You've never been saved, but you'd like to be saved. Every head's bowed and every eye closed. Just stand right where you're at. Just stand. And you can be saved. Now, see, nobody expected anybody to be saved, but there's four people standing right now. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm a, Jennifer and, and Mark, or Mark, if you would help me with this person right over here. If Jennifer's not in here, uh, grab you, you and a lady go right over there. Uh, Juan, are you here? I, I got I got some young men. Pastor Ray's back in the back. Uh, Omar, I think, has had to leave. Uh, Adrian, on your last Sunday, why don't you go pray with uh, next to the last Sunday? Uh, go with them, Mark. Go with them. Double tag team them. Amen. Tag. You can never have too many men praying, right? If the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, then prayer of two men righteous men will avail more. Amen. Share Christ. Just do it. We've had four people. Receive. Is there another? Say, I'm not saved. I don't know if I died today if I'd go to heaven. I've been hurt so much, I don't even know if anybody loves me. I am searching and I can't seem to find it. Let me tell you something. Christ is seeking you right now. The very thing that you feel is God reaching out to you. God tugging at your heart. God pulling you and drawing you to Him. Loving you while you're at your worst. You don't have to do things to get better. You just need to receive Him. You know who you are that I'm speaking to. And this is what I would ask. I would ask for you just to release it, let it go, and say, by standing, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. I feel Him pulling me in my heart, loving me like I've never been loved before. Forgiving me, accepting me where I'm at, at my worst, loving me. Is there anybody like that? You just stand because I know He's speaking to somebody's heart like that. Just stand right where you're at. Don't be afraid. Just stand. Receive Him. Your heart is trembling. Your hands are sweating. You are shaking inside because you, you know God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Terry, you and Mary get, get together with that, with that young lady. She stood right there and said, you're talking to me. No, I'm not talking to you. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. That's been five. Is there another? Is there another? said... I've never been loved like you're talking about unconditionally, not having to change anything in my life, all the bad things that I'm doing. You mean he still loves me? He does. He loves you at your worst. And he'll forgive you, and he'll make you anew. Is there anyone else? Just stand. Receive the love of Christ here this morning. Praise the Lord. Just stand right where I, I feel in my heart God is still speaking, still moving. Is there another? Man, I hate to close, goodness gracious, because there's something about the Holy Spirit speaking to us that we just know that we know there's somebody else needs to be saved. We know it. Pray, church.
Father, I pray for that one more person that you, that you know that, 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 Lord, that your spirit is so strong that they'd receive you today. I challenge them. I challenge them to receive the Holy Spirit this morning and to trust you as their Savior. In Christ's name I pray. That prayer was for you, that person that wouldn't stand, that couldn't stand. Did you stand? Praise the Lord. He stood. He stood. Give the Lord a hand clap offering. Now, that's how the Holy Spirit of God works. When we don't understand what He's doing, He's still doing what He does. Six people have received Christ this morning on a message about broken relationships because, see, the Spirit is telling you that He will never leave you nor forsake you and the relationship you have with Him, He will never break. He will never break it. He will never break it. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never break it. Everybody say it. He will never break it. That's how strong His love is. Six people have received the Lord. Is there a seventh? If That's God's perfect number, by the way. Is there another that says, I want a Savior who will never break that relationship? I didn't say you wouldn't break it. I said He would never break it. And because he won't break it, you are eternally secure. You can't run from him once you come to him. He will always be there. Is there another? Is there another? Praise the Lord. There's a little man right there. I tried to get his glasses before the service. Amen. You want to receive Jesus into your heart, buddy? You want, will you pray with him? I know it's a little fella, but he stood up. He stood up and he received the Lord this morning. All over the building, we've had, we've had more mature people. We've, we've had a little one. How old is he, Mark? Six. Don't you guys believe Jesus can save a six-year-old? He even tells us, don't you hold those kids back and forbid them not. Let them come unto me. Jeremiah, are you in here today, buddy? I think they, they might have they might have left early. They had an appointment. But I got a grandson who's who, how old is Jeremiah? I don't forgot. I think he's six, five. He think he's five. He'll tell you right now, Jesus is in his heart, and he'll sing those praise songs. He can save a five year old. He can save a four year old, and he can save a eighty year old, and a forty year old, and a fifty year old. Age is nothing to him because he's eternal, and we're dealing with eternity. I know we had seven people come to Christ. Seven people come to Christ. But I bet this is going on. I bet number eight is saying, I wish I'd have stood up. We had eight. I bet number nine is wishing they'd have said that. I wish I'd have stood up. I wish I'd have had courage enough to receive Christ. I wish I'd have had faith enough to receive the love of one who will never leave me nor forsake me, that will never break a relationship. I bet number nine is saying, I wish I'd done it. Number nine, here's your chance right now. I will wait till hell freezes over for you to stand. <laughs> is there a number nine in here that wants to receive the love of the Father? who will never break a relationship, that will love you eternally, no matter what you do. Is there another? It, oh, man, I know there needs to be. There needs to be. But I'm going to count my blessings for the eight that did. Amen. For the eight that did. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Pastor Ray, come on down in the water. I'm glad it's you and not me. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Now, for those of you that have made this profession of faith, you've trusted in Christ, what Ray is doing is the next step. You're making a public statement of your acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're literally, symbolically, going to be buried under the water in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection, to follow the Lord in new life. It's symbolic. You'd still go to heaven. 
you would still go to heaven even if that had not been done you'd still go to heaven where are you going with that money I think he's going to Goodwill. <laughs> and what Ray is doing, he's baptizing believers. The baptism doesn't save them. They're getting, saved because they, uh, getting baptized because they have been saved. And they're publicly professing before you that they're going to walk in a new life. They've died of the old life, walking in the newness of life. 